Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Delighted to be able to participate in your seminar, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, my brief discussion of the demographics will parallel what David just said. Uh, I think it's well known now that the African population will double between 2040 and 2050. Uh, it depends on the country uh, as to exactly when the doubling occurs, and there is some differentiation in terms of growth rates across the continent. Uh, however, I think the critical thing to say at this point is uh, this is an unstoppable train in terms of the next doubling. Uh, the mother who gives birth to the 400 millionth Nigerian has probably already been born. Okay, so there's no stopping this. There may be a potential to stop further dramatic demographic growth, uh, but the demographic inertia is so vast uh, that uh, the question becomes really, how are we, how are you especially going to cope with this rather than how are you going to stop it? Uh, why is the population growing so fast? Um, and Africa is increasingly different from the rest of the world. Of the 2.4 billion or so people who will be added to the world by 2050, about 1.3 billion will be in Africa. Africa is really the only continent that's going to get younger for the next few decades. The uh, rest of the world, especially the developed world, is going to get older. Uh, simply because the number of live births is going to decrease as a proportion of the population. Some countries, like China, are going to start getting old very quickly because of their population practices over the last few years, and Asia has slowed down. So Africa will be a very young continent in a world which is getting older. The challenge ahead, I think, is quite significant. To give you some idea, Asia grew by uh, grew its population by about 3.7 fold between 1950 and 2050. Uh, uh, the relevant uh, time for rapid population expansion in Asia. So that's about 3.7 fold over a century. We're predicting that between 2000 and 2100, Africa will grow by 5.18 fold. Uh, so even compared to Asia, which in the popular mind, at least in the United States, is considered to have a fast uh, growing population, or was until recently, Africa is growing that much faster. Why is this happening? Gets down to country level explanations, but certainly the major trends across the continent are uh, relatively poor access to contraception for women, relatively poor education of young girls. We know that when girls have some education, at least through uh, the beginning of secondary school, they tend to delay marriage, space children a little further apart, and finally, continuing insecurity about wage income so that children remain viable economic assets, even with the urbanization that David describes. Uh, what does this population demand mean? It probably means that if you want to keep the number of poor people in a country steady, not, um, not decrease poverty, but keep the number of poor people steady, the demand will be to grow by 5% a year, okay, every single year. Uh, that's pretty hard to do. It was done briefly during the last decade or so due to commodity prices being relatively high, but it will require countries to grow relatively fast just to keep the number of poor people steady. Uh, to make inroads on poverty, it will probably require growth in the order of 7 to 8 percent over a sustained basis, something very few countries have seen. About 11 million jobs, new jobs will be needed across the continent uh, to cope with the increasing population each year. So as David said, this feeds into the urbanization story because, of course, so many of the people who will be born uh, will either be born in the cities or will migrate to the cities. And 
urbanization, as David said, is not only a phenomenon of migration, but it's an, also increasingly a phenomenon of the organic population within urban areas having children. Uh, so we shouldn't think of it just as a migration story, but the urban populations have achieved a critical mass in many countries so that their own population growth is, will be exceedingly important. How to understand all of this? Um, and let me step back and try to put it in this perspective. As late as 1960, there was very little in the way of urbanization across Africa, and populations were spread over vast territories. And there was still a significant number, a significant amount of vacant or available land. Um, and of course, in previous uh, decades, previous centuries, there had been a vast amount of land and not a very significant population. What that meant was that the tr traditional African method of protest was often to move to areas where a state or a leader could not control the population because in the pre-colonial period or even in the colonial period, um, the reach of the state was just not that far. There was so much vacant land that people could move. Very famous social scientist in this country, Albert Hirschman, once wrote that people have three options when faced with unhappiness. They could exit, that means they could leave, they could voice, which means that they could stay in place and protest, or that they could be loyal, which means that they could just uh, ignore whatever unhappiness that they uh, encountered. The dominant form of African protest in previous generations was exit. That is to move away from the king, the sultan, the oba, whatever, uh, the colonial governor to a place where they couldn't be reached. Even in post-independence Africa, for a while we saw populations that tended to move away from the state because of whatever unhappiness, taxes, oppression, and the like. The fundamental change in African politics from a perspective of centuries is the one that David described, which is now a large number of people across the continent are moving to the places where the state is the strongest. That is the urban areas, not only the capital, the capital tends to be, in most countries, a very large city, but also the relatively few other urban places where the state is strong. Now, African states may not be very strong, but they're guaranteed to be strongest in the urban areas. And really, for the first time in millennia, Africans are moving towards the state rather than away from the state. What does that mean? On the one hand, it's an unbelievable opportunity for state consolidation, for the state to relate to, expand its reach, expand its control, if you want to say that, over more people. The problem African states have had in the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial periods is extending reach over population given difficult geographies and not very high population densities. Now, for the first time, as the, the states have the opportunity to control people who are moving to it. So that's an unbelievable opportunity. The challenge is, paralleling what David said, that the people are really close to the state now. And that the threat of popular po protest, the threat of unrest, the threat of urban protest, destabilizing states is much greater than it has been in previous decades because the urban population is a much larger proportion of the total population. African Governments have traditionally tried to appease urban populations with preferential prices, subsidies, provision of whatever social services they could. That strategy was viable because in previous decades, the urban population was relatively small. Now you have a host of countries which will see their urban populations be more than 50% of the national population in the next few decades. And to appease or to relate to those populations which are physically quite close to the state and therefore quite threatening to the state will be very expensive indeed.
So there's an opportunity for the state to control the population much better, but there's also the opportunity for populations to voice their grievances and to protest much more than before. Uh, what does this mean? I think it means a different story for every single country. African countries have an unbelievable opportunity in the next few decades to be young, dynamic places in an old, graying world. That's an opportunity that should not be underestimated. Young people are the most dynamic, they're the most entrepreneurial, they adapt to technology quickly. Africa will have a greater proportion of young people than any other place in the world. Harnessing that opportunity will be an enormous plus. However, um, uh, if, that, uh, if growth does not occur, if those young people are not given opportunities, then they have the potential to destabilize uh, the very cities that they now are moving into. I'll conclude by noting, and David's uh, written a book on this, that increasingly the challenge will be to police urban areas in African, city, in African countries as opposed to border control or control of um, rural protest movements that spring up from time to time. A lot of your focus, I know, has been, well, what's the threat in the hinterland? Increasingly, given the population growth, the threat will be in the urban area. Uh, so, I don't think there's any destiny here. Uh, African countries are neither destined to fail nor, frankly, destined to succeed. Each one will have to make up its own mind and adopt policies. Some will succeed, some will fail. Uh, but the opportunities and the dangers, I think, are both quite stark. Let me stop there.